Hello everyone. In this session, we will discuss the bank reconciliation. The bank reconciliation is one of the most important internal controls for your cash account. Remember, cash is a very important asset. I would say also cash is the most important asset. But the bank reconciliation is very important in the real world. I will start by using an analogy to tell you what's the bank reconciliation. Think of the bank reconciliation as checking your luggage after a trip. See, I have all these analogies about traveling. I like to travel. Imagine you have packed everything carefully before leaving for vacation. And when you return, what you would do is you want to make sure that nothing is missing or out of place. And when I travel, before I get back, my wife usually calls me several times to make sure I bring back everything, especially if I'm staying at a hotel because I tend to forget stuff. So basically what you would do is keep going with this analogy. You would go over your suitcase, through your suitcase, checking that all your clothes, souvenirs, and essentials are still there. And compare that with your packing list to ensure nothing was lost or damaged along the way or you did not forget anything in the hotel. So anything on the list should be in your luggage. And anything in the luggage, it should be on the list. Like you did not add something and you are not aware of it. So you check the two. So reconciliation is comparing two items side by side. And at the end of the day, they should be all the same. Or they should be both the same. In the same way, a business uses bank reconciliation to unpack its financial record and compare them to the bank statement. Because all your cash transactions go through your bank, so you want to make sure your record and the bank matches. Just like going through your luggage, the business looks at every transaction. Deposit, payment, fees, mistakes made by either the bank or the books, and make sure everything reconciled, make sure everything is matching, to make sure everything is accounted for and nothing has gone missing or been, or been recorded incorrectly. In this process, obviously, it's form of internal control ensure that the company's financial baggage here is in order, catching any errors or discrepancies before they become a problem. Now, in the real world, as I mentioned, the bank reconciliation is extremely important. When I was in practice, I would prepare several bank reconciliation on a weekly basis for various businesses, obviously, monthly reconciliation. So we will start, though, by discussing bank services in order to understand the elements that are listed on the bank reconciliation. Let's go ahead and start to discuss the bank services and at the end we'll work a multiple choice question. Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, farhatlectures.com. Our financial accounting course is best for online students and students who are struggling in their financial accounting courses. We cover all the essentials from debits and credits, adjusting entries, closing entries, financial statements, and all balance sheet accounts. Our comprehensive course include lectures, multiple choice, true-false, as well as practical exercises. Start your free trial today to help you pass your financial accounting course. Your success starts here. So before we dive into the bank reconciliation, let's take a look at some services that your bank account will provide as a form of internal control to your business. The first thing is so obvious, the bank serves as a secure place to store your cash, your asset, and manage cash transaction. Now bear in mind, and this is the idea that I want you to think about, you do have at your company a general ledger for cash. That's great. At the same time, your bank account will also have a series of transactions, something like your general ledger. And this is exactly what, we'll, what we will be reconciling later on. And this is the idea that I want you to have in mind. You have your cash account and your accounting record. That's great. You're keeping track of that by your accountant. And your bank is keeping track of all of your cash transactions. And this is what we will reconcile later on. But this is one of the most important feature. And oftentimes, this feature is free for most businesses where the bank keeps track of your money and keeps track of your record. So we have a bank account, a secured account provided by a bank where individual or business can deposit and withdraw money. 
production, safes. It helps you manage cash flow and keep records of your financial transaction. You will have something called signature card. When you open a bank account, individual or businesses authorized on behalf of this individual must provide their signature on a signature card. Now bear in mind, although I said this, it doesn't mean the bank will check every check you deposit or you withdraw based on that signature card. The risk is the withdrawals. So they don't check any every check. If, if they suspect something, yeah, they will pull that signature card and determine if that signature matches. So this card helps the bank verify the legitimacy of checks and other transaction. Again, this only gets pulled randomly or when the bank suspect a fraud. Now these days, as I mentioned, most transactions are not are not written via a check. So most transactions are processed electronically. Also electronically, the bank will have some way to guess. And I, what I mean here is guess. Guess means what? Guess means estimate. Think it's a fraudulent transaction based on your transaction. So every once in a while, I'm sure you, you, you this happens with you. Your bank calls you randomly. Say, this transaction does not make any sense. Is this really your transaction? For example, if out of nowhere, you purchase something in California out of a sports place, like you're, you're buying tennis balls and you're in Pennsylvania, you, your physical address in Pennsylvania, and suddenly you purchase something in California. The bank might call you immediately. It's like, is this a legitimate transaction? Especially if 10 minutes earlier, you filled your gas in a, in a gas station in Pennsylvania. So how did you move from Pennsylvania to California in 10 minutes and you're buying tennis balls? Now, why am I giving this example? Because I did get that call once and someone was using my bank account. So the bank will try to protect you as much as possible because they want to protect themselves. But don't rely on this. Make sure you secure your checks. Other services that the bank account provide are deposit tickets. What are deposit tickets? When you make a deposit at the bank, you get a receipt and this is called the source document. It details the type amount of the end of checks being deposited. It shows you a breakdown. How much cash did you put? Coins, currency and checks. And this is a proof of the deposit. Why is this good? Because it ensures accurate record keeping. It's part of our internal control, deposit ticket. They do, they do provide you this. And obviously the bank can provide you multiple bank accounts. Now, why is this important? Because for companies, what they do is they want to keep track of separate accounts, of separate business transactions in separate accounts. For example, certain banks, and this is just an example, they keep track of their payroll funds separately. So they have, you know, bank account number one, which is their main bank account, and they will have a bank account only for payroll. Now, why would they do that? Let me explain this since we are talking about internal control. So let's assume every week or every two weeks or whatever the pay period, the company knows they need to have, for the sake of illustration, 25000 in payroll expense. So that's their payroll expense. So here's what they do. The company will transfer 25000 to their bank account that's specifically for payroll. And all the employees, when they withdrew their money, whether it's withdrawing by check or electronically, they withdrew it from this 25000 now, why would you do that? Why would you draw the payroll on a different account? Here's the thing. You, you are afraid that someone is writing payroll checks or transferring money from payroll, which they should not. So if you know it should be 25000 and someone tried to withdraw more, the bank account will be negative and the bank will notify you that someone is trying to withdraw money and you expect only 25,000. So it's a form of internal control. Now you could have a separate account for each operation. You could have a separate account for each division, for each geographical location. But I just gave you the payroll and this is called an impressed account. It means at the end of the period, it goes down to zero. It reset to zero every, every period. So this practice helped in managing cash flow and organizing finances. And obviously, the most important bank account service, especially these days, is EFTs or electronic fund transfer. And this refers to the movement of money from one bank to another or from one bank to another customer through their bank account using electronic means without the need for physical checks or cash. And most transactions these days are, are conducted via 
electronic fund transfer. I pay all my bills. I pay all my bills through electronic fund transfer. Seldom I write a check. Seldom. Now, what would this do? This method is more popular. It's convenience, speed, and cost effective. Speed is important because when you write a check, and we're going to see that later when we look at the bank reconciliation, when you write a check, first you write the check, then you mail it. When you mail the check, it may take two to three days in the mail. Then after two to three days, the customer will, will receive this check and it may take them a day or two to deposit. Now you're up to five days. Then it will take the bank a day or two to clear it. Now we're up to seven days. So from the time you mail the check until the time is with, until the money is withdrew from your account, it's taking seven days. Now, if you're making the payment, that's what you want. You want to delay this process as much as possible. But if you're receiving the money, you don't want the mail, you want the money immediately. And that's why everyone would rather have EFTs, pay immediately, receive immediately. Now, you, you want, <laughs> all businesses will prefer that they pay in a check and receive EFTs, but that doesn't work that way, right? Because you're a busy... Uh, on one side, you cannot have the best of both worlds. Therefore, everyone is using EFTs because it speeds the process and and it's way more cost effective. Mailing the check, well, the mail is, is, is cheap. It's like, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't mailed things in a while. Maybe 40 cent, 50 cent, I, I really don't know. Okay. Um, but also the timing to mail the check, to go put it in the mail, to have the envelope. It's a process. Electronic fund transfer, it's automatically you log on your computer and you transfer the money. Actually, before I started this recording, I made a bank transfer. It took me basically a minute. I have everything ready. I put the amount. I know exactly what I need to send and it's send, it's send quickly. Now, in addition to all of this, the most important thing that the bank will provide you is something called a bank statement. A bank statement is a record of everything that happens. And we're going to focus on the bank statement much more when we talk about the bank reconciliation. Let's talk about a check. And as I mentioned before, <laughs> these days, less and less people use checks. They use electronic fund transfer, but they both serve the same purpose. So to withdraw money from a bank account, the account holder known as a depositor can use a check. So for example, here, I want to pay John Doe. So I'll write a check. I'll have the date, you know, 1 7 20 27. I'm going to pay a million dollar to John Doe. So for what purpose? So you're going to see what the check serves. A check is a written document that instructs the bank to pay a specified amount of money from the depositor's account to another person or entity known as the payee. So the party that receives the money, which is Joe Bloggs here, is the payee. One more time, you can write a check or you can do EFT. It serves the same thing. Now, what would a check or EFT tells you? It tells you a few things. First, when? When did the transaction took place? When, did, when was the check written? Who do you pay? John Doe. How much? A million dollar. The check number, and this is important, the check number here is 0005, which is number five. And this is part of the internal control to make sure all the checks are accounted for. Each check has a pre-printed number. For what purpose? Investment. Who signed it? Who signed the check? That's the person who's responsible for this. So notice the checks tells you a lot. Same thing with an EFT. An EFT will tell you who paid. How do we know who paid if it's electronically? The individual that processed this payment will have rights through a password. And when this individual entered their password, which is unique to them, we know who wrote the check. How much when everything is, is captured in an electronic fund transfer. So those are some of the services that the bank will provide you. But as a business, one of the most important thing when you have a bank account is to prepare what's called the bank reconciliation. And this is the heart of this session, a bank reconciliation. But I wanted to go over some bank services so you understand how the bank works. Now, what is a reconciliation? Reconciliation as a term is used often in accounting. Well, let's reconcile account receivable. Let's reconcile accounts payable. Let's reconcile the bank account. But what is reconciliation? This important topic. When you hear the word reconciliation, it means you are doing two things. You are comparing one item 
to another item and make sure those two item matches. So you're looking at some number and you want to make sure you have another source to reconcile this number. Why? Because you want to make sure this total is coming from another legitimate place. Both matches, both should matches. You're reconciling. It's basically a form of matching. So the bank reconciliation is a crucial step that ensure the accuracy of the company financial record and their bank's record. I can tell you from first-hand experience. When I was an auditor, we prepared at least five different bank reconciliation every week for different businesses. So what happened is businesses, since they don't have their own accountant, they will outsource this process to their accounting firm. So every week I would have, you know, I would be responsible for five different businesses where I will prepare their bank reconciliation. How do I do that? I would look at their bank record and I will reconcile that to their general ledger cash balance to make sure everything on the cash balance appear in the bank. Everything in the bank is on the general ledger and everything is legitimate. Now, why would they, why would they want us to do it? Because they want a third party, someone outside the company to check on the transaction. So differences between the bank statement balance and the depositor book balance often arise due to timing differences or error and this is this is it this is what we need to talk about now we need to talk about timing differences errors will cover errors but we're going to focus more on timing differences so when you when you start a bank reconciliation what's a bank reconciliation again you're looking at the general ledger you're looking at the cash general ledger and you're looking at the bank and those, you're comparing those two. Let's take a particular date. Let's assume you're preparing the bank reconciliation for the month of July. So July 31st, July 31st. Here's what's going to happen. When you're looking at the ending balance, they will be different. So for example, your cash balance might show $8,000 your bank statement might show 7465 hold on a second didn't you say that my cash general ledger should match my bank statement because my bank statement is keeping track of my cash true well but you have something called timing differences because of those differences there's going to be a difference between those two balances and our job as accountant is to make sure we account for those differences. Now, if there's an error, we also have to find the error. But we're going to focus on timing differences because errors could be anything. And we'll talk about errors later on. So what are those timing differences? Well, first, we're going to look at the timing differences that you will need to adjust for the bank balance. So when you start with your bank balance, we have something called deposit in transit. What is deposit in transit? What is deposit in transit? Let's go back to July 31st. Let's assume on July 30th, I mailed a deposit. Okay. On Ju let's. I don't. I don't use. I don't know. Use mail because no one uses mail anymore. On July 31st, after 3 p.m., the company made a deposit of three thousand dollar. So on their general ledger, here's what they did. Let's assume this was for 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 a payment. They debited cash. $3,000. They credited account receivable $3,000. Now, this was July 31st. The bank did not post this deposit because it was after 3 p.m. until August 1st. So when we look at uh, when we look at our bank statement, this deposit does not exist in July. Why? Because the bank showed it in August. So this occurred after the bank cut off time for transaction or are sent by mail near the end of the period. They will appear, this deposit will appear in the next bank statement, which is August, but in August, it will not appear in our cash ledger. It will be shown as it was deposited in June. So the first thing we have to do is deposit in transit. Look for any deposit that it is on our general ledger, but not in the bank account. If we find any of them, what do we do? You add them. You add deposit in transit. So you'll start with your bank balance. You would look for deposit in transit and you add them. How do you look for deposit in transit? You review all your deposit in the bank and you compare it to your general ledger. And you're going to say, wow, this one, this deposit of 3000 is not there. You add. 
Remember about the checks, what I told you, it may take seven days for the check to clear. And I told you from the time to mail it, take two to three days. The business may hold it a day or two, then deposit the check, then the bank then the bank will take a day or two to clear that check. It could take up to seven days. So checks issued by the company that have been recorded in the books but not yet cleared by the bank. Those are outstanding checks. Let me give you an example. Let's assume you paid your cleaning expense. Someone cleaned your office for you and you pay them $500. So you debited cleaning expense and you credited cash $500. And this transaction took place on July 27th. So in your general ledger, general ledger cash, you recorded a cash decrease of 500. Then you mailed that check. That check did not receive this cleaning business until August 3rd. So they did not even receive the check till August 3rd. So obviously it's going to take them a few days maybe to deposit the check for the check to clear. So this check will not show on your bank statement. However, it's showing on your books. So what do we do with outstanding checks? Anytime we find an outstanding checks, we deduct outstanding checks. So these checks have been sent to the payees but have not yet been processed by the bank. And sometimes it's not only the bank don't have them, the cleaning business, they kept them because they don't have time to deposit them at the bank. They're very busy and this could happen. Sometimes you send it and the person lose it or it get lost in the bank, it get lost in the mail. And I saw this. I saw checks outstanding for more than a month. Either the business did not receive them or they received them, they lost them or they received them. They put them away and they forgot to deposit them. But any outstanding checks, they got deducted from the bank balance. Now, the bank could make an error. Well, errors made by the bank, such as recording deposit or withdrawals incorrectly. Now, if there is an error, that's the hardest thing when you are preparing a bank reconciliation because you're looking for something that someone made a mistake. The, the deposit and transit, the outstanding checks are recorded. Errors are not. You have to look for them. The reconciliation process includes identifying and correcting these errors by comparing the bank statement with the company's record. So how would a bank make an error? They will add money to your account that's not yours or they will deduct money from your account by mistake. So someone withdrew money, they gave the money from your account, they deducted your account and this could happen because you, the account number are very similar. This happens all the time in the real world. Or someone depositing money, they deposit money in your bank account. And that's why you have to prepare a bank reconciliation to determine how would you know there's a bank error? Well, if it's a deposit, you don't care, right? <laughs> because you want that. Not really. <laughs> that's not your money. But if there is a withdrawal by mistake, you will not know about it until you prepare a bank reconciliation because you're going to see this withdrawal on your bank statement. You look at your general ledger cash and you'd say, I don't see this. Why is this money deducted from my bank account? I, 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 never, I never did this. This is not a legitimate withdrawal. So this is on the bank side. So on the bank side, usually it's deposit and transit, outstanding checks. Anyone could make an error, including the bank, and we could make an error. But this is on the bank side. On the book side, which is the cash general ledger, well, what do we have to do? We have to look at the bank statement and see if there's any interest earned or any unrecorded cash receipts. So we have to see if the bank gave us any interest or they collected money on our behalf. What do we do with those? We add them to our general ledger. Banks may collect item on behalf of the depositor, such as interest on account or payment received via electronic fund transfer. Oftentimes, your customers will pay electronically and you're not aware of the payment until you receive your bank balance. So these amounts are credited and in the language of banks, credit means they're giving you money. They are credited to the depositor's account but may not, be, may not yet be recorded in the company's books. So if you see an EFT on the bank, so here what, here's what's happened. You receive an EFT for $200. It's on your bank statement. You have to see if you have this on your general ledger. If not, you add 200 Same thing. The bank gave you $10 of interest. If it's not on your books, you will add it to your books. Then the bank might charge you fees or we might have something called NSF or non-sufficient checks. So for interest earned and unrecorded deposit, you add to your book balance. Bank fees. What are bank fees? Well, let's keep going with this example. The bank might take you know, $20 fee from your account. 
monthly maintenance fee. You may not be aware of it until you receive your bank statement. Once you're aware of it, you deduct this $20 from your general ledger cash. Don't worry, we'll work an example. NSF checks. What are NSF checks? Let's assume a customer sends you a payment for you know, $300. Luck, luckily, not luckily, uh, happily, you debited cash 300 and you credited the account receivable for this customer 300. And you said, great, this customer paid me 300. I debited cash, credited their account receivable. And this was July 25th. And you deposited this check in the bank account under the impression this is a legitimate $300. What you find out later that that amount is incollectible. What does that mean? It means that check that the customer gave you is no good. Yes, they, you received the check, but they don't have money in their bank account. So what do you have to do when this happens? When this happens, here's what you did. You added, you added $300 to your cash account here under your general ledger. But the bank says, uh-oh, this money is no good. What do you have to do? You have to deduct the $300. So to deduct the $300, you have to debit the account receivable for the customer, $300, and you have to credit cash, $300. Now, I did not mention this, but I'm going to mention this later. Anything you, Any change you make on the general ledger, you have to prepare a journal entry for, and we'll work an example. Don't worry about this. So the banks initially credit the, the account, but later debit it because the check bounces. We, can, we say the check bounces, and sometimes they add a fee to that. What's bounce check? It bounces, it means the check is no good. They charge you a fee. Also, you could make errors. You means the business. Mistakes made by the company, it's, it's, it's accounting record, such as recording an incorrect amount for a check or a deposit. These are identified and corrected during the reconciliation process. Now, what is an error? So, on your general ledger, let's assume you wrote a check. Let's go back to that supplies guy. Uh, supplies how much did we pay the supplies uh, I believe let's assume we paid the supplies Let, let's let's do the another example let's assume we pay not supplies the uh, cleaning expense let's assume we debited clean we wrote a check first of all we wrote a check for uh, 345 dollars we wrote a check for 345 dollars to the cleaning supply we debited expense 354 we credited cash 354 so notice what we did Rather than, rather than 345, rather than 345, what's the actual check? We recorded an amount of 354. What, what happened is this. We deducted more from our book balance. We deducted more. The first thing you want to know is what's the difference? What's the difference between 354 and 345? The difference between 354 and 345 is $9. What you did is you underreported your cash by $9. You only wrote a check for 354, but you said you wrote it for 354. So what do you have to do? You have to make an adjustment to reduce your cash, and also your expenses are overstated by $9. So how would we fix this? You're going to debit cash, $9, specifically 9 and you're going to credit cleaning expense, reduce your cleaning expense by $9 to fix the problem. So the first thing you do when you have an error, first you compute the amount of the error, the amount. And this amount could be overstating your cash, could be understating your cash. Here, we understated because we deducted more. We understated, therefore we have to go back and add $9. Let's assume we wrote the check for 330 and it's supposed to be uh, I'm sorry, we recorded it for 330, but the check is 345. What do we have to do here? We have to add expenses of 15. We debit cleaning expense of 15, and we credit cash of 15 to fix the problem. Now, cleaning expense, 330 plus 15, equal to 345, which is equal to 345. Cash credited 330, cash credited 15. The check is for 345. It, it matches. Again, the hardest thing for a company is to find that error, to find that error. What's the error? Well, it could be anything. You could make an error, the bank could make an error. Well, the best way to illustrate a bank reconciliation is to work an actual example, but we'll do this in the next recording. For now, we're gonna work a multiple choice questions to test our basic understanding. 
So let's take a look at this multiple choice questions from farhatlectures.com. This multiple choice, I selected it on purpose where it includes an error because I wanted it to be a little bit more challenging. The bookkeeper incorrectly recorded a bank deposit of as 840, but the bank recorded the deposit at its correct amount of 420. How will this error be treated on the bank reconciliation? So here they're making it easy for us. Why? In what sense? First, you have to understand who made the er Where is the error? Is it on the book side or is it on the bank side? So who made the error? Well, it says here the bank recorded the deposit as, as its correct amount 420. So as far as the bank is concerned, they increased your cash by 420 because this is how much you actually received. Now, who made, who made the error? Well, the accountant. Okay, so let's look at A. Addition per bank statement balance. We don't have to change the bank statement. <laughs> that would be nice if we could change the bank statement because we think the bank made an error because we deposited more money than we actually did. So this error is not a bank statement error. So that's that's out. Deduction per bank statement, out. The bank did not make an error, period. So first you have to understand, you are adjusting your books. How are you going to adjust your books? Are you going to add more to your cash or are you going to deduct from your cash? And the answer is, you have to reduce your cash because what you did is you debited cash 840 and let's assume this was for revenue. You credited revenue 840. Well, but you only have $420 in cash. So the revenue should have been 420. So what do you have to do? You're going to have to debit revenue 420, credit cash 420. You have to reduce your cash balance by $420. And since you're adjusting your books, you need a journal entry. As I mentioned, we'll work another example, a complete example in the next session, including a complete journal entry, a complete reconciliation. What should you do now? You want to go to Farhat Lectures. Look at additional MCQs. That's going to help you with your bank reconciliation. Whether you are an accounting student, a CPA candidate, CMA candidate, invest in yourself. Good luck. Farhat Lectures is always here to help.